morning. Thank you so much for joining us today for the DFC Town Hall with its focus on 2X in Central America. I'm Meryl Burpo. I'm in the Chief Development Office at DFC. DFC is the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, and we are part of the U.S. government. You'll hear more about us later. First, I want to just quickly explain that we will have simultaneous translation for the event. Um, you obviously are hearing me in English. Hay interpretación simultánea por esta conferencia. Hay un botón por inter interpretación debajo en la pantalla. Elige el botón por español si prefiere ese idioma. I am now going to introduce our next speaker. We are very honored to have with us today the U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala, Ambassador William Pop. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Meryl. Good morning. It's uh, a real honor to be here with you all. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to underscore uh, how much uh, the U.S. mission in Guatemala in particular um, is looking forward to working with all of you uh, interested in uh, Development Finance Corporation uh, opportunities and uh, tools that are available uh, to consider for investing here in the region. I want to thank, uh, for starters, the Development Finance Corporation team uh, for hosting this town hall and creating this opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors and financial institutions such as yourselves uh, who are interested in doing business here uh, and learning more about DFC financing. Uh, in particular, I want to thank uh, Vice President for External Affairs, Algene Selgeri, uh, and to all the team. Um, uh, but particularly Algene, who you'll be hearing from shortly for organizing the event, uh, which is really intended to connect uh, DFC financing for projects uh, in places like Guatemala and the rest of Central America where it can make uh, really measurable and important differences. I also want to thank all of our private sector partners, uh, including uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, the chambers from the individual sectors, including industry and agriculture and many others in Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador uh, for attending, uh, but also for sharing the invitation with your members and getting as many uh, companies and potential investors uh, into this event and connected with DFC as possible. The town hall uh, today is really intended to introduce you uh, to the US International Development Finance Corporation. Uh, which is America's development bank. Uh, as Merrill mentioned, it's part of the US government. Uh, it is really um, an innovative uh, and very important part of the US government uh, for connecting with the private sector to finance solutions to our most critical challenges in the developing world today. Uh, the DFC invests across many, many sectors, including energy and healthcare, infrastructure, technology, and, and many others. Uh, it also um, has been very successful in providing financing for small businesses, and women op entrepreneurs, uh, in creating jobs in emerging markets. And, and in particular, I've had the privilege of working with DFC, uh, both in Brazil, where I previously served, uh, here in, uh, in Guatemala as well, which have been priority uh, locations for DFC uh, to do projects. And in particular, uh, DFC's 2X initiative, uh, which Algene heads, uh, is targeted at women-owned, women-managed, and women-focused businesses uh, to really address the unique challenges that women face globally to unlock is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Um, and we hope that this uh, town hall today and this discussion will be uh, a, a step for your company's efforts to grow um, and to also create employment and economic growth in the region. Uh, for decades, the United States has enjoyed a very close commercial, uh, business, cultural, uh, and historical uh, relationship with Central America. Businesses, uh, both uh, from the United States and from the region, um, have been at the heart of our relationship. It's the trade uh, and commerce and investment uh, that really sustains and enriches so many parts of our, our relationship uh, with countries in the region. And we know uh, 
uh, but there's even more that we can do to increase imports, exports, uh, and investment on all sides. At the core, of course, of our um, commercial relationship are strong companies competing in a supportive environment. <clears throat> that supportive environment uh, means having access to quality investment and financing op options. And we know that DFC can be one of those options, and, and we want that to be in your calculus an option for your business opportunities. Uh, when done right, new business contributes to the region's economic development. It also improves the skills of employees uh, through technology transfer and managerial knowledge. And we know that that benefit also um, is a much better option than the brain drain that occurs when the youngest, most capable workers, the entrepreneurs, the future of uh, countries in the region of Central America migrate and they leave and they leave all of that uh, that they represent um, and take it to uh, other places. So what uh, is at the center of our uh, policy uh, for reducing irregular migration is to create opportunities in the region, economic opportunities. Vice President Harris just announced further investment uh, in the region from many companies yesterday. Um, we're looking to have even more in the future uh, and DFC is an incredible tool to make that a reality and to really uh, foster the economic growth uh, and social stability that we want um, in the region and we want to have um, continue to, to develop between our countries. Uh, and, and the United States is continuing to push as a partner um, and a constructive uh, collaborator, economically speaking. We also know that uh, there are some critical strategic uh, challenges um, to making this reality possible, including financing uh, and a lack of financing and how it can stifle opportunity. So uh, we want to make sure that that financing is accessible to as many sectors as possible, uh, at as many levels as possible, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, specifically for women and women-owned businesses. When women are left on the margins of the national economy, uh, so much opportunity is squandered. Innovation is halved and the development of human capital is uh, much, much reduced. And we've seen it repeatedly in evidence that supporting women as entrepreneurs, leaders, employees, and consumers not only increases gender equity, uh, but it also reduces poverty and it produces much, much more inclusive and robust economic growth. In just dollar terms, uh, we're talking about over a trillion dollars in global growth opportunity by just including women uh, in, in growth markets and increasing their participation in uh, economic opportunities. That's a market potential that's bigger than China and India combined. So we want to continue to work uh, closely um, uh, on these topics with all of you. Um, and DFC is an incredible tool to make that happen. Over the past three years, DFC has actually closed more than 200 deals that have qualified for 2X investment. investment uh, that supports women-led uh, growth. And that's the, the single largest place that that's happened has been in Latin America. So we wanna keep working uh, with, on those goals. Uh, we, today is part of that discussion. Um, and we hope uh, that the information that you receive uh, through this conversation uh, will contribute to your investment decisions, investment decisions that will be profitable and that will drive the economies of the region. Um, so we look forward to working with you here at the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala. We have a very uh, active team uh, focused on developing deals with DFC. So both working with DFC directly and with the embassy in Guatemala, we'll be very happy uh, to support your uh, investment goals and develop the jobs that we want to see in this region, and jobs that are inclusive, dignified, and, and really create growth long term. I wish you all the very best in your endeavors and a great discussion today. Thank you again to DFC for organizing this and thank you again to all of the chambers and all the companies participating in what I know will be a very fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, thank Mr. So Ambassador. Much. Go ahead, Roxanne. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Pop. Let me introduce myself. 
Um, I'm one of the speakers who's going to be presenting the DFC 101. Um, my name is Roxanne Ryan Alazier. I'm the managing director at, and I work for the chief development officer's office. Really what we're doing in presenting these town halls is we're using this as an opportunity to share a little bit more about what the DFC is doing in order to expand its impact. As many of you know, DFC is the Development Finance Corporation, is the US government's development finance institution. Our goal is to use products such as investment guarantees guarantees, loans, um, whether they be corporate or project finance, and equity and other financial tools in order to advance the goals of foreign policy, development impact, um, as at development impact foreign policy, as well as just really supporting the economic development growth in the countries that we work in. So in the next couple of pages, one of the things that Meryl and I are going to do is we're going to lay out what the DFC does um, how we work, and then how you can be engaged in the process. Andrew, would you mind setting up the, the presentation pages? Thank you. Okay, can you start on page three? So just to give you a sense for who we are, as an organization, our goal is really to support the economic growth in the countries that we operate in. We do that by fostering investment um, through the various products and services that we offer. In addition, one of the goals that we really are focused on is really mobilizing private sector capital. So one of the things we are really focused on ensuring is that for every dollar that we invest, you know, close to another dollar, if not two dollars of private sector capital um, helps to um, is, is able to be capitalized and mobilized in order to accelerate economic development. Really, one of the things that we're doing as part of our, of our vision is to make sure that we support the goals of, you know, transparent government, we support the goals of, you know, free markets, and that we're really supporting the goals of free enterprise and the local economies that we serve. Next slide. And so one of the things that we really do that makes us, I think, different than many other banks is we are focused not just on, you know, DFC's bottom line. Certainly all of our projects, we want to make sure that those projects are financially viable, but we also want to make sure that they're really supporting of the local economies that we work in. So you'll see that we invest in projects in, urban, in both urban and rural economies. And that we often invest in projects that enable us to support marginalized communities and really support communities that don't always get access to capital. And that's a big part of why we're here today. Our goal today is to really talk about DFC's focus on supporting female entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and projects that support um, the advancement of women in the economies that we serve. Next slide. Okay, so the great thing about what the DFC does, the Development Finance Corporation, is that we don't act alone. And so, you know, we act as part of a larger, um, I guess you can say an amalgam or a consortium of other US government agencies. The first is the Department of State. You're gonna meet some of these, um, some of the leaders of the Department of State later on in the call, but they're really focused on diplomacy, working with your local government to ensure, you know, really strong economic integration, political integration, and really strong uh, diplomatic relationships. Then there's USAID. That's the US Agency for International Development. Much of what the U.S. Um, Agency for International Development is, does is it really supports economic growth or other humanitarian needs, but they use grants. So grants, as many of you know, cannot be paid back or are not paid back, and that's very different from the DFC. But that's a big part of what USAID, they, USAID does. They support humanitarian activities, and they support a variety of social and economic programs through grant financing, as well as through things like capacity building and technical assistance. Okay, MCC. MCC is actually the Millennial, Corporate, the Millennial Challenge Corporation. What they do is they work with the local government to create an enabling environment. So 
recognizing that, you know, in some instances, the local economy or the local government may not have all the tools and resources to really um, expand and become um, as advantageous to the private economy or to its people as they can be, MCC, the Millennial Challenge Corporation, really does a, a great job of creating an environment that enables these economies to better serve their communities. And then, of course, there's the DFC. That's what we do. We're really focused on, you know, mobilizing private capital. We're focused on financing and, and putting private sector resources to use in support of economic growth. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to share with you, you know, our key priorities. One of our key priorities is climate. So, you know, many of you have heard a lot about the kinds of investments that um, a variety of development finance organizations are making in the area of climate. Well, DFC is no different. Um, one of the goals that we have is to become net zero by 2040. Another goal that we have is to ensure that 30% of the investments that we make are focused on things like climate adaptation, focused on things like climate mitigation, and that we do our part in ensuring that we strengthen um, the environmental footprint that we have all over, all over the world. And then um, global healthcare, that's the second priority that we have. So as many of you know, COVID has really demonstrated the challenges that you know, many countries have, not only in responding to COVID, whether it be through testing or through vaccines, but also in their kind of global healthcare, uh, the healthcare value chain. So all throughout the value chain, we've brought in experts in financing um, and experts in healthcare who are really focused on the key activities that are necessary to strengthen the global um, healthcare chain, whether that be everything from testing, whether that be from towards um, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, and one of my personal favorites, distribution, making sure that you get, once you have a product or um, a particular medicine, that you're able to get it in the hands of patients that need it so serious, need it so importantly. And then of course, as I've you know, just briefly mentioned as a third priority, we're focused on you know, women and women-owned businesses. Algene is here, she'll be able to share more detail about that, so I won't go into that. And then of course, a fourth priority is internet access. So why is internet access so important? Well, it's important because it's often kind of the first tool that enables you to access other key things that are needed in, in a local economy, whether that be access to digital banking, Banking, access to telehealth, access to things like um, educational resources, much of that is taking place online. And it often gives developing economies the opportunity to really leapfrog um, in terms of development. And so that's be, it become an area of great focus for the DFC. Frankly, it always has been, but we're really underscoring that with this administration. And then the final thing is this idea of, and I'll just mention it in this way, build back better and this idea of an inclusive economy. So really one of our objectives is to ensure that in everything that we're doing, we are not just growing as a nation ourselves, but we are de demonstrating as an example, but also pushing out the idea of inclusive growth meaning that we're supporting women, we're supporting minorities, we're supporting underserved communities, um, rural communities, individuals with disabilities, and individuals who are largely marginalized. Our goal is to be an example of what inclusive growth can do in terms of growing an economy. Next slide. Okay, so I love sharing this slide. So what's great about this slide is this slide demonstrates where we work. This slide shows you that we have a portfolio of $33 billion. So to give you some context, the next largest, the next largest development finance institution is the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank. Um, and their portfolio is 12 billion. Um, so this is a pretty large portfolio. And to give you some more context, that particular organization has staffing of a thousand people. We with a $30 billion portfolio have staffing of about 
three to 400 individuals. And I think one of the things you'll see here is that it's a pretty robust and diverse set of countries that we work in. Yes, I would say the vast majority, a, a large percentage of what we do is in Latin America, which you'll be happy to see, as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa. But we work in a variety of different regions, um, covering a variety of different SEPs, uh, different segments. Um, and I think what's really dynamic about this is not only the variety of uh, projects that we do, the variety of regions that we serve, is the fact that even though we have this wide variety of places that we serve, actually 75 to 80% to of the projects that we do are actually small business projects. So for example, in a given year, we may commit 100 projects, 70 to 80 of them go to small businesses. And I think that's, that's something that we are only hoping to grow as we move forward. Furthermore, at least 60% of what we do is in low and low middle income countries. And that again is something that we really wanna focus on. We wanna make sure that our investment is going to the economies that need it most. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted, this is a, a great slide to give you some sense for kind of where we're going as an organization. So as you can see, 24%, so that's almost a third of our business is in Latin America. Um, I think, as you can see, it's kind of a really good um, slice of everything that we do. And as you can see, much of our focus really is in Central America. As we've transitioned from being OPIC to the DFC, that's going to only expand. As I said, you know, because so much of what we're doing is focused on low and low middle income countries, we're looking for ways to be able to finance innovative and dynamic projects, um, many of whom are hopefully on this call today, that we believe will be able to advance our goals for economic development, advance our goals of supporting women, address issues like COVID, address issues like um, access to the internet, etc. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to, unless, I, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Meryl Burpo, who's going to provide a little bit more detail about products and services. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. And by the way, I know that someone asked about this in the Q&A. We are going to share these slides with you via email after the event. Uh, and the event will also be recorded and available for reviewing. So DFC offers several different tools that are designed to help you increase your investment potential in Central America. The first is debt financing. We offer direct loans as well as guarantees for projects that range generally from $2 million up to as much as a billion dollars. Uh, and the tenor for these uh, loans or loan guarantees is set based on the needs of the project. Some as low as short as three years and others going on to say 25 years, depending on project requirements. DFC has also recently obtained the right to make equity investments. And so we can make direct equity investments in your projects, as well as uh, equity investments in investment funds, which then can invest in smaller projects. We offer feasibility studies, uh, funding for feasibility study, as well as for technical assistance for projects that we believe have the potential to receive financing or political risk insurance from DFC. We don't offer independent feasibility study or technical assistance support, unless it's a project we think we will ultimately support. Um, I mentioned investment funds. We can do de debt or equity investments in investment funds, and these provide a great opportunity for us to support smaller businesses. And then political risk insurance. This is a really important part of our portfolio uh, we can offer coverage against losses due to currency and convertibility. That's the ability to take local currency and convert it to a hard currency. Just want to note, we do not offer devaluation of currency coverage. Um, we can protect against government interference, either through passive or active expropriation and political violence cover, including damage due to terrorism. And you'll hear more about that probably during our Q&A session. Next slide, please. 
This is just a quick slide about our MTU unit. This is a unit that works very closely with USAID. We support finance, um, we offer guarantees to support uh, reducing the financing gap and improving development impacts in countries where we're operational. The USAID mission sets the objectives and then DC, DFC tools are uh, offered to support their goals. Next slide, please. Just gonna go through this very quickly. This is the cycle that you will go through if you present a valid project to DFC, an eligible project. Um, first, of course, is sourcing. Just very quickly, that's how we obtain our deals, either through events like this or for banks providing us uh, information about a deal or individual investors approaching us. The deals are pre-screened for eligibility and the eligibility requirements, which we'll go over shortly, are so important please consider these as you determine if you are an eligible candidate for DFC projects. Um, and then the application process, Presuming, presumably you have gotten to a point where you've determined and we have agreed that you are eligible for a financing. You can find our application information as well as eligibility requirements and prohibited sectors at dfc.gov. We'll go through a due diligence period, and this will include analyzing the management of your project, making sure that there are no issues of concern in terms of key man, credit, corruption, et cetera. Uh, and then of course, doing the very important tool of evaluating the credit risks of the project and the development impacts of the project. There are different levels of approval for different size projects. Uh, projects under 20 million are generally um, re are generally just reviewed by credit policy from 20 to 50 million. They receive views by our investment committee and projects over 50 million require an approval of our board of directors. Once you have your final approval, you will have a project close process in which we finalize all of the agreement terms. And then during the project operation, we have the ability to monitor your project to determine if all of those development impacts we expected for your project are actually coming through, actually happening. And then also to make sure that we understand the financial returns on your project. Next slide, please. And the next slide. I think this is one of our most important slides that we wanna talk about today. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time to go into it. The point of our town hall is really to understand the local companies that are eligible for DFC support and to expand our clientele, to make it possible for more of you to work with us. But we do have eligibility requirements, and it's very important that you think about whether your project aligns with our eligibility requirements so that you're not wasting your time in approaching us. The first is that the transaction must be bankable. That means it has to be able to create the kinds of financial returns needed to operate the investment and to earn some return. We want to know if this is a brand new project a greenfield project or a project that's already in operation, which we call a brownfield project. We wanna understand if the project has a feasibility study and a business plan, and I'll go over what a business plan entails shortly. Um, and if the project is seeking uh, equity, we wanna understand how the project will develop over time and offer returns within say a five to seven year period. Is there any sort of a sovereign guarantee? That is not required by any means, but we do wanna understand if you have one and are there any local requirements we should be aware of? DFC is all about development impact. We are trying to determine how your project is going to support economic growth and social benefits in your country. And so we're going to evaluate the environmental impacts of your project, the social impacts of the project. You know, is it creating jobs? Is it introducing a new technology that's innovative? 
Uh, we want to understand if the project is in a lower to lower middle income country. We can work in upper middle income countries with some uh, criteria established for that. We generally don't work in high income countries. We want to understand what your project, uh, what sector your project is in. As Roxanne noted, there are several priority sectors, but I want to uh, emphasize that your project does not have to be in a priority sector in order to be eligible for OPIC, I'm sorry, for DFC. Um, and then we wanna be sure that the project is additional. You know, Have you looked for private sector financing from a local bank and found that you just can't get your financing on terms that are necessary for your project to be, uh, I'm sorry, commercially viable? We do look to see if your project aligns with our foreign policy goals. We are a US government agency. We'll take a look at the political risks of your project. And we wanna understand management capacity. Has your management worked in this field before? Are they skilled in this area? Who are the shareholders in the um, company, if there are any? Who are the ultimate investors in the project? And what is your financial arrangement with any shareholders? And of course, particularly important today, are there women in management or on the board? Next slide, please. So I mentioned to you that I would tell you about the elements of a business plan. This is the other most critical slide that we have going, if you ask me. And this is where we ask, tell you that these are the things we are going to need to see from you in order to evaluate your project for a loan or an equity investment or, or political risk insurance. So we need to have an explanation of what your project is. What do you want to use DFC's money to do? Uh, we wanna understand your track record in this area. And what is your financial plan? Who are the other expected debt and equity investors? What tenor amount for your loan are you seeking? What's the other credit support? The market analysis is incredibly important. We wanna understand the industry you're in and your target market, your supply and demand calculations and where you see your company fitting in in the market. We'd like you to highlight market trends and describe the competition and the business value. Project ownership will be reviewed. Again, we wanna understand who owns the company and what percentages of the company each of the individuals owns. And we want to understand the professional expertise of the key personnel. For sales and marketing projections, we wanna understand the project economics, the technical parameters of the project. And uh, we need you to outline how you expect your sales of your goods or services to work. And finally, we're going to ask for your financial projections. Uh, and your funding request. Exactly how much money are you seeking? What are you projecting your financials to be so that we can understand from your balance sheets and your cash flow statements and your projected financial performance how you would repay a loan or return an equity investment? Next slide, please. This is the final slide. I'm gonna go through fairly quickly. Actually, there's one more after this. Uh, I think we've explained fairly um, close you know, in much a great deal of detail um, what you are required to have here, but just to reiterate um, in any company, and this is a particular bank in Latin America, you know, what they were, would need to um, deliver. We wanna see the additionality that we are not you know, that there's no private financing available for the project, why you need us. We wanna see the commercial viability or the bankability of the project, what tools they have in place to monitor risks, those sorts of things. Uh, the management capacity, as I said, who are the executives? Do they have skills? And the financial projections, as we noted earlier. Next slide, please. Algene is going to talk to you in a moment. Algene Sajeri is our VP of Office of External Affairs, but she also leads our um, 2X program. But just very quickly, 
DFC is all about empowering women across the globe. We launched the 2X, we call it the 2X initiative for women and uh, in 2018 with the goal of facilitating access to financing and unlocking opportunities for women. I think you've heard quite a bit about how much we have done over 8 million to date, supporting over a hundred, I'm sorry, I think that's 8 billion, <laughs> 8 billion to date, supporting over 142 X projects. And we've also recently committed to mobilizing an additional 12 billion in 2025. And as noted by the ambassador, our 2X portfolio uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean is one of our largest. I'm going to turn it over now to Algene Sajeri, who I noted is our VP of OEA and the head of the 2X program. Algene. Thank you, Meryl, and thank you to Roxanne as well, and everyone who is responsible for organizing this town hall across three countries. And really appreciate uh, Ambassador Pop uh, stopping by to give opening remarks. Your uh, support of this effort is critical to its success. So thank you, Ambassador. And as Meryl mentioned, my name is Algeen Sadri. I am Vice President of External Affairs at DFC, and I also wear another hat as the head of Global Gender Equity Initiatives, and, and that includes our 2X initiative. In that role, I oversee our efforts to strengthen gender equity and women's economic empowerment across our portfolio, which is really a top priority for DFC. Through the agency's 2X Women's Initiative, DFC has committed to facilitating access to and unlocking investment opportunities for women in emerging markets across the globe. We prioritize investments in companies that are owned by or led by women, that create quality jobs for women, and that provide products and services that specifically benefit women. To date, the agency has mobilized over eight billion dollars in 140 unique transactions through the initiative. And earlier this year, we committed to mobilizing an additional $12 billion and to reaching 15 million women and girls globally by 2025. I am very excited to participate in the first of our town halls to focus on women entrepreneurs and business leaders and to highlight the role that women play as the engines that drive economic growth. This is becoming increasingly important as the world in this region continues to struggle with the COVID-19 pandemic. Women-owned and led businesses are going to be critical for catalyzing growth, security, and resilience at the family, community, and national level. We know that women-owned businesses contribute substantially to the GDP, but we also know that when women access meaningful employment opportunities and participate in economic life, they tend to invest more of their income into their families and communities which leads to better health outcomes, more schooling for children and more stable and secure societies. And finally, we know that women tend to repay loans at the same or higher rates than men and diverse companies make better decisions that tend to result in higher earnings. So investing in women makes good business sense. The 2X portfolio in Latin America and the Caribbean is one of our largest, making up over half of our investments spread across all our sectors. The bulk has gone to financial intermediaries that in turn on lend to women-owned small and medium-sized enterprises. Our specific portfolio in the Northern Triangle, the three countries represented here today, is a key priority for expansion and growth. And we know that women in the Northern Triangle, as in all regions, face a range of challenges in accessing needed resources and in growing their businesses. We want to maximize the incredible investment potential of women entrepreneurs in this region, not only because it reflects our strong commitment to gender equity, but also, as I emphasized earlier, because it makes good business sense. Rather than highlighting examples myself, I am thrilled to welcome two 2X two DFC clients who have agreed to share their experiences with us today. 
John Simon is president of Total Impact Capital, the U.S. sponsor of Azure Source Capital. Azure received a DFC loan in December 2019 to support small scale water service providers and finance the rehabilitation, expansion and improvement of water infrastructure in El Salvador, which faces chronic water issues. And Ada Curtarte is the chief marketing officer for Banco Industrial in Guatemala. The bank received a DFC loan in July 2020 to expand its portfolio to small, medium, and growing enterprises with a focus on women-owned and operated businesses, which make up a large part of Guatemala's economy. Welcome, John and Ada, and thank you both so much for taking the time to be here with us today. My pleasure. Placer, gracias. Absolutely, thank you. Um, well, John, let me start with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about Azure and its work in El Salvador? Sure, so Azure Source Capital is a financing vehicle to support um, community water service providers uh, throughout El Salvador and now actually Honduras as well. So we made our first loan, uh, we, we received the DFC financing in 2019, we made our first loan in 2019, and now uh, we've made in El Salvador another uh, 19 loans, uh, and we've made our first loan in Honduras uh, uh, just, just last month. Uh, so, so far, our, our DFC loan was, was $4 million. Uh, so far, we've deployed $3 million in, in capital. Uh, uh, we've also have co-investors, including Calvert Impact Capital, Mercy, uh, 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 the Mercy uh, Investments Partnership Fund and the Inter-American Development Bank, as well as Catholic Relief Services. And the basic model for Azure is to leverage the technical assistance that's provided by our partners on the ground, our technical services per service partners, who are, are organized by Catholic Relief Services, a very prominent NGO active in the region, to identify high impact investments that can really increase access to and quality of water to underserved communities uh, throughout the region. This sounds like a fantastic initiative. And actually I'm really familiar with the Catholic Re Relief Services. And it sounds like a really comprehensive um, model where you're relying on various partners. And I wanna say, I know that you're a DFC alum, but why <laughs> did you and Azure choose to work with DFC and how did working with us benefit Azure in a, in a unique and special way? Yeah, so uh, obviously I have, a, I have a, a, a soft place in my heart for DFC or uh, OPIC as it used to be called when, when, when I was there uh, now 13 years ago. Time, time, time fly, flies quite fast. But you know, when we look to, you know, and, and as, as Total Impact Capital, we're an impact investing firm that's focused on impact first opportunities. And Azure, of course, is, is such an opportunity where the focus is on uh, increasing access uh, and the quality of water to under, underserved communities. And when we look at partners who can help advance these types of impact first, first opportunities, we, we look to three basic uh, financing partners today. One are, are um, foundations. So we see a lot of, lot of investment that comes to us from, from foundations that share uh, the, the mission objectives that we have with the financing vehicles we're trying to create. Two is um, impact focused vehicles like Calvert Impact Capital that are sort of created to promote impact and pool, pool funds from multiple investors to do that. But three, and this tends to be the largest pool of capital uh, that we're able to tax us is development finance institutions. And in that regard, DFC has been our strongest partner uh, throughout the years. Uh, and the main reason is because they share the same image of development that we share, that you know, uh, 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 capital can be a critical component to, to, to serving the bottom of the pyramid to getting people services that they that they otherwise wouldn't have, and to creating sustainability, which ultimately, in, in, in our view from impact investment, is one of the ultimate benefits of an investment approach, which is once you're able to provide a service that people are willing to pay for and that generates revenues, you can provide that ad infinitum into the future, and you're not limited by the by the access to 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 grant financing. Absolutely, sustainability is absolutely critical. Thank you so much for that. Um, as we highlighted, Azure's uh, DFC loan supports small-scale water service providers and improves access to safe water, especially in rural areas of El Salvador. 
we also know women typically bear the largest responsibility for gathering water for their families. How do you think Azura's investments uniquely impact the lives of women in communities? So, and, are so, you, and are you already hearing about some of the longer term impact and the benefits of, of oh, these women? Yeah, absolutely. So as you point out, uh, usually it's uh, uh, the role of women in the household, both uh, uh, parents and also young girls to, to um, gather the water if, if, if water is not available. Often the water service providers we work with without the investment that we're able to provide, can only provide water a few days a week, only for a few hours a day, which means for those other periods of times, uh, women have to go out and find, find water. Uh, that's time away from school, that's time away from caring for their family. And if they're not able to get high quality clean water, that has a significant health impact that is going to also take the time of the caregivers in the household, often women, uh, to deal with, deal with, 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 with the, the, the health issues that, that uh, family families will be affected for. So water available when you need it means women can spend time in school, or girls can spend time in school, women can spend time uh, on other other family priorities or on their work or on building building businesses. And high quality water means that people aren't 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 waylaid by by very preventable disease. Absolutely. People don't realize how critical water is. I think COVID maybe highlighted that a little bit. You know, clean water, it's important for health, for wellness, uh, for, of course, food. So critical, such a really critical basic. Uh, I would, I would say one other, other thing. Clean water is also a very important component for business. So yeah. we see a number of, of sort of, say, restaurants, for instance, that exactly. desperately need clean water. And often these are women-owned businesses. That that are able to operate with with the the clean water that's provided from from uh, Azure financed water systems. Absolutely, that's a very critical point. Um, and speaking of women, we talked about the emphasis two X places on women in leadership, and we understand that Azure CEO is a woman, but she was unfortunately unable to participate in this town hall. Can you talk about the leadership roles women are in at Azure, and what practices and policies are in place to support women taking on and advancing up the leadership lab ladder in in that uh, in that company? Yeah, so our regional director, in, based in El Salvador, but who oversees the whole region, is, is a woman. Uh, she's actually on maternity leave. That's why she wasn't able to participate uh, in, in, in this conference today. But also, when, when like I said, Azure leverages the technical assistance uh, that's provided by our partners organized by Catholic Relief Services. And one of the key components of that technical assistance is building the management capacity of the partners. And one of the metrics by which they measure that management capacity is how many women are in leadership, both at the governance level and the executive level. So a, 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 ma a major metric for our success is the, is the increasing responsibility uh, for women in, in managing these water systems. Fantastic. And again, Catholic Relief Service is a tre tremendous partner. Um, and so now we've talked a lot about Azira and you, and it's fantastic that you've been able to access this um, financing. Can you tell me what your recommendations are for participants in this town hall today as they su seek support for DFC and for ZFC itself? Yeah, well, so, so for folks who are seeking support for DFC, I think first and foremost, have a clear developmental vision of what you're trying to do. And, and things, you know, there's a whole range of development that, uh, uh, that can, can um, result from, from investment. But I think you know the, the stronger the development case, obviously, uh, the more the more uh, 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 interest it will tend to tend to inspire inspire at DFC. Uh, I think as well as a strong development case, you need a very strong business case. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able being able to to uh, present how how the DFC investment will ultimately be paid back and and what the both uh, financial and social impact, environmental impact. Of it will be, I think. I, I think is critical, and then another element that's been very important for us is being able to have strong partners. And so, you know, for Total Impact Capital, we're based um, in the United States. Uh, we don't have a, a, a presence on the ground, but we do have partners who have a presence on the ground, uh, and that allows us to to be able to present a, a complete uh, picture to DFC. Um, in terms of of, of DFC, uh, you know. Uh, Things are always a challenge, um, you know, when, when you're we're trying to, to do uh, exciting sort of uh, blended finance transactions. 
And so, so from, from our perspective, um, I, you know, I, I think finding ways, and I think DFC has done this, for instance, with the Pi Squared initiative um, and some, some other elements that, 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 that DFC has done. But fine, and I, I believe Azure went through Pi Squared, but I could be wrong about that. But I, but I, but I do believe finding ways to streamline the processes and mm. condense the, the, the time is certainly something that those of us who work with DFC on a regular basis uh, really, really appreciate. Well, thank you. We appreciate you. We appreciate your advice to both DFC and these potential partners and, and clients that we are um, seeking to, um, to, to support in this region, this critical region. And we know that you have other commitments, John, today. And so um, I'll let you jump off. Thank you oh, so much for speaking see, with me. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, accommodating me in this way. I would love to stay and hear what Ada has to say, but uh, I, I do. You are right. We are we are sort of pressed pressed for, for time today. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate you. Bye bye. Bye. Ada, let me hola. turn to hola hola Ada. Um, I want to let me. Um, I'm going to move a little slowly for interpretation services. Um, let me move into hearing some of your experiences and perspectives as a DFC client. Similar to John, can you tell us a little more about Banco Industrial and its work in Guatemala and why you uh, chose to work with DFC? No, Banco Industrial es el banco líder en Guatemala y forma parte de la institución financiera más importante de Centroamérica. Eh, al día de hoy, pues, eh, muestra un desempeño sostenido y con indicadores muy saludables a lo largo del tiempo. Eh, acoge a más de 10 mil colaboradores en sus instalaciones, de los cuales el 50% aproximadamente son mujeres. Y es un ícono para Guatemala de desarrollo. Fue creado hace más de 50 años y, lo, y su propósito principal es el desarrollo sostenible para nuestra comunidad. Eh, lo que como vas viendo a lo largo del tiempo y de nuestra conversación eh, se vuelve algo que nos vincula fuertemente y eso es una de las principales razones por las cuales eh, trabajamos con DFC por esa alineación estratégica que existe en ambas instituciones, esa eh, compatibilidad de valores y la misma visión eh, que tenemos en cuanto al desarrollo. Eh, Banco Industrial pues también se destaca por su infraestructura física y tecnológica, eh, como mencionaba antes Roxanne, eh, hay muchas posibilidades en facilitar eh, la banca a través de la tecnología y las soluciones financieras a través de la tecnología, especialmente para mujeres, para alcanzarlas y para poder resolver algunos desafíos que puedan tener en movilización o eh, en, el, en el uso de su tiempo. Entonces, eh, Banco Industrial, pues hoy te digo, es un banco muy consolidado, un icono eh, de también de servicio, de alcance en los distintos mercados y los distintos segmentos desde el corporativo hasta el individual y en áreas tanto urbanas como rurales. Eh, es un banco muy guatemalteco eh, que se ha expandido en la región a través de la corporación financiera que representamos. Eh, es un, un banco líder en este campo. Thank you. It sounds like a very um, unique bank indeed and a, an important uh, leader in the region in financial services. And I'm really, speaking of the uniqueness of the bank, I'm really very interested in your specific focus on supporting women-owned businesses. Why did Banco Industrial decide to prioritize loan to uh, women entrepreneurs? Bueno, uh como tú sabes, en este último acuerdo que nosotros iniciamos con ustedes, teníamos un alto enfoque al desarrollo eh, de las pymes, eh, porque estamos convencidos que representan la gran oportunidad para el desarrollo económico eh, y social de la región centroamericana y latinoamericana. Sin embargo, a lo largo de nuestra conversación y nuestra relación, ustedes nos ayudaron a visualizar mejor eh, la oportunidad que existía en el segmento de mujeres a través de la iniciativa 2X, eh, que me, por lo cual estoy muy emocionada de conversar contigo porque sé que eres la que lidera esta iniciativa. Eh, esta, 
eh, a medida que fuimos conversando y que ustedes nos mostraron la gran oportunidad, que como tú decías, es un gran caso de negocio, pero también tiene una aceleración en el impacto de lo que nosotros buscamos, al impactar al segmento de mujeres, al tener más, eh, un impacto más robusto, más inclusivo, eh, más sólido a lo largo del tiempo, eh, nos ayudó a visualizar mejor la oportunidad que hay allí y a orientar mucho de nuestros esfuerzos, a afinar y eh, de esa manera fuimos acelerando el alcance de nuestros objetivos eh, y alineándolos mejor eh, con esta relación. Entonces, eh, este enfoque, eh, digamos, es algo que nosotros visualizábamos, pero que afinamos al momento de conversar con ustedes y, e ir detallando el esfuerzo y el acercamiento al segmento de mujeres, con distintos esfuerzos, no únicamente... Eh, digamos, operativo, sino que también facilitando herramientas para que el financiamiento que llega a sus manos sea mejor utilizado, sea más productivo y al final, eh, pues vas creando mucho más valor para todos los stakeholders eh, al trabajar con mujeres. Como tú decías, tiene un mejor desempeño la cartera, tiene un mejor uso el recurso y al final vas creando y desarrollando una plataforma económica más robusta para la región. Absolutely, and it's an honor to, to talk to you today as well, and, and it's really important to, to highlight why you uh, chose to focus on women entrepreneurs, and I want to um, want you to help me and explain to some of the uh, participants today what are some of the specific challenges that women entrepreneurs face in Guatemala. Eh, bueno, como te mencionaba antes, algunos de los desafíos es el, el acceso a la banca eh, y eh, que tienes que ir resolviendo con canales distintos, muchas veces con tecnología, eh, acercarte más a este segmento, eh, también la formación académica y los conceptos de administración, tanto financiera como de negocio, son algunos de los desafíos que presentan y que de repente las vuelven menos elegibles para el financiamiento. Entonces, tienes que trabajar en ambas. Eh, en ambas dimensiones, tanto en fortalecer su capacidad de administración, su capacidad eh, de liderazgo y también mucho en el autoestima, en la, en la creencia de que pueden ser eh, muy buenas eh, liderando grandes negocios y entrar en nuevos mercados, eh, ampliar eh, de manera acelerada sus negocios. Eh, nosotros estamos apoyando en esa dinámica y creo que esa es parte del, de la riqueza de trabajar con ustedes y que ustedes trabajan también con una plataforma muy eh, robusta de herramientas que te ayudan a visibilizar mejor cómo eh, cerrar esas brechas eh, que tienen las mujeres y que las hacen más calificables a un financiamiento eh, o más elegibles a un financiamiento eh, que va a tener un buen ciclo eh, de retorno. That is fantastic. And I, I really like what you said about making sure to empower and support women entrepreneurs by letting them know that they do have the ability, giving them the self-esteem uh, to, to move forward and seek these types of financing opportunities to grow their businesses. What advice would you give to women entrepreneurs now, maybe who are on this call, looking to leverage various financing resources? Eh, bueno, que eh, primero tengan muy claro su caso de negocio, que lo, lo revisen un poco lo que decía John. Eh, hay que validar que estamos en la misma dirección y que vamos a construir el mismo resultado. Eh, entonces, sí, fortalecer todas sus capacidades, utilizar las herramientas disponibles que, por ejemplo, a través de USAID y otras instituciones también están disponibles para fortalecer el desempeño de sus eh, operaciones, pueden hacerlas elegibles a estas eh, oportunidades de financiamiento. Eh, también tener buenos socios, eh, no se trata de ir solas, sino que vayamos juntos avanzando eh, también eh, establecer las redes que existen entre mujeres. Hay mucho apoyo que se está disponibilizando para las mujeres y hay que aprovecharlos, hay que buscar ese equilibrio entre las metas personales y eh, comerciales que se están estableciendo porque al final tienen un retorno 
importante en su comunidad, en su familia eh, en, y en sus metas personales. Entonces, buscar esa, eh, esa elegibilidad, también buscar un desempeño sostenido y una estructura de ejecución bastante sólida eh, y eso implica pensar en el futuro, pensar en grande, porque tienes que establecer desde pequeño una estructura muy sólida para cre crecer de manera eh, sostenida. Eh, creo que esas, eh, esos, esas recomendaciones les daría primero, pero muy importante es eh, primero empezar por apropiarse de la idea de esa posibilidad y hacer el primer contacto de solicitar, porque a veces lo que pasa es que no haces ese primer contacto, eh, contacto, ya te, ya te das, eh, no te das permiso de avanzar sobre ese, esa visión que tienes. Entonces, eh, sí, creo que, que el primer paso es por lo menos informarte, participar y entender qué es lo que necesitas para seguir creciendo, pero no empezar por una limitación. Eh, yo creo que nos, nos gusta mucho trabajar con DFC, eh, nos ayuda a acelerar nuestros resultados, a ser más impactante en lo que hacemos eh, y digamos en este momento nos gusta mucho la iniciativa que viene hacia adelante que es B3W, eh, que nos va a ayudar a ser todavía más sólidos con esto, a integrarlo a, a, a 2X y eh, ir más consistentemente por un desarrollo sostenible en nuestra región. Absolutely. And we, we, first of all, I want to say, I really love what you're saying about and making sure that women are empowered and feel that ownership to, to move forward and grow their businesses, um, giving them the confidence to do that. And so I, I'm, I'm excited to, to speak with you as a woman, as a woman, um, you know, leader in your, in the bank, uh, the bank's chief marketing officer. Um, I think it's really critical to, to empower the women that you serve and your clients. And I appreciate that. And also I appreciate your comments about B3W. We do think it is going to be critical. Gender is a key component of B3W is a high priority. And so is financing. So we are going to, um, DFC is part of that initiative. I actually am one of the people who uh, participate in the uh, gender policy council at, at the uh, White House and support the B3W gender um prong so you know thank you for that i want to just um ask you one last question um you know you're a leader uh, you are a manager you um you know you're in a leadership position at the bank and i'm just curious what advice do you have for uh women executives in particular outside of what how they you know can form partnerships for financing um, and you know, uh, seek support from DFC. Um, what advice do you have for them in shaping and molding their careers and their in their businesses? Bueno, siempre estar preparadas para liderar, fortalecer mucho tus capacidades y no eh, ubicarte tú misma en un área eh, limitada, sino que cultivar mucho las capacidades porque las vas a utilizar a medida que que vas avanzando y vas conquistando eh, los ambientes. Y no perder tiempo en, en lo que no puedo hacer, sino siempre encontrar lo que se puede hacer eh, e ir motivando e inspirando a otros, tanto hombres como mujeres, eh, no dejar a nadie atrás. Eh, creo que eso es algo que ayuda a impulsar a las mujeres cuando eh, vamos eh, llevando a todos a ese crecimiento, no importando su género, eh, pero tienes un rol de liderazgo que por naturaleza pues se te da la oportunidad eh, y hay que aprovecharlo, fortalecerlo y enriquecerlo en todo momento. Creo que en cualquier momento y desde cualquier área eh, ejecutiva en donde se, te desempeñes puedes tener mucha influencia y, eh, y no empezar con una mentalidad eh, de que no tienes capacidad o que no puedes lograr algo. Ara, you really are uh, speaking my language. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I mean, you are just an inspirational leader and a role model to women. And just um, those words of empowerment and encouragement are, are really greatly appreciated. Thank you so much uh, for participating today and for your leadership at the bank and your inspiration to other women um, in business and women entrepreneurs. Thank you so much, Ada. I'll turn it back over to Miro to facilitate the question and answer session. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Algene. It was wonderful to have you here today to lead the interviews and to talk about 2X, such an important program for us. Uh, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, I do want to open it up for questions and answers. You may type your questions into the Q&A session. I see some people have also put them in chat. We'll read both, don't worry, but do please put them in Q&A if you haven't typed yet. And we, you may type them in English or Spanish. We'll, we'll translate questions and I will notify people within DFC about the kinds of responses we're looking for if questions come up that I can't answer in as great detail as they can. So Andrew Yavinsky, do you want to begin reading us the questions? Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the first question that we have is, is asking for a bit more of clarification on the direct process after the town hall in terms of accessing financing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking that. Roxanne will actually go over the full process after this, including who to contact. And we will share that contact information uh, with you in the email when we send you the copy of the presentation. There will also be uh, the contact information and the process to go through. But just very quickly, we're going to begin uh, over the next few weeks with having you reach out to Katya Levin of Nathan, who's working with us on organizing this event. And then there will be some technical assistance available to you through the Athena group. Uh, which will be available to help women to develop their projects. And of course, you will see that you can also reach out to DFC support, DFC contacts, or to embassy or US aid people, depending on the type of support you want. Next question. The next question that we have is, what are DFC's plans to increase growth capital in the region? Um, if they're talking about equity, I believe they are. Um, I would like to turn that over to Susanna Chevery if she can address that. Hi, Suzanne. I think you're on mute. Hi. Um, sorry, <laughs> I just dialed back in from um, having to go to another meeting. Can you repeat the question? I wasn't sure I caught the beginning of that question. Um, okay. It was whether, what were our plans to increase growth capital? You know, not just to provide debt financing, but to oh, increase okay. capital. So in equity investment capital. Okay, yeah. so, so we are, um, we uh, in the Office of Equity Investment Funds at DFC, we now have the ability to um, provide equity investment in existing um, equity funds, as well as equity for co-investments in those funds, and then also direct equity uh, investments for standalone uh, companies, where we which can take our uh, equity capital. So what we're looking at is really expanding our reach beyond just providing debt capital into um, you know, direct equity investments. And we are really looking at, as I'm sure we've um, discussed um, throughout this call at uh, climate um, related uh, funds and companies and uh, companies that provide, um, you know, uh, opportunities for um, 2x uh, for women-owned businesses and and such and um, also looking at venture capital early stage types of investments so we're really looking at the broad spectrum um, across sectors uh, across initiatives and also uh, you know with the different sort of um, you know uh, stages of, of growth, whether it's early stage or growth capital. So we're really looking at a number of different avenues to deploy this capital and we are growing our team. Our team has has now, as, as, as you all know, has gone from just providing debt to equity and we are providing a lot, um, you know, expanding that team, um, hiring a number of people as, as um, the situation will allow, but we're really trying to uh, really, um, develop more, um, more ability to deploy the capital. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Next question, Andrew. Um, the next question is, is staying on the topic of, of equity, but there was one person that wanted to know if you could provide an example of an equity investment in Central America. 
Suzanne, do we have any investment funds that we could point out that have made equity investments in Central America? I believe there are a few, but of course I can't think of them off the top of my head. Yes, I think that we have um, in, uh, I, 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 may, I may tap into my colleague, Bill Pierce, who's also on the call, who might be able to help me jog my memory, but I believe that we may have some um, early stage investments in Central America and Latin America. And um, I know we have a lot of real estate and housing, but that's just on the debt side. Yeah. In terms of um, equity and in Latin America, Bill, I see that you're on. Yeah, hi. I have, I yeah. Sorry, I was late. I also got calls going through until then. Yeah. Um, in Central America, um, unless there was the past debt funds um, in the power side, um, like um, the one you followed, Suzanne, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that was Mexico, it wasn't Central America. Right. Yeah, so I don't know. And that was debt, much. that was debt. Yeah, it was debt, yeah. Equity, yeah. no, no, um, we haven't done anything yet. In, in that. All right, so what we'll do is we'll make sure as those funds develop that we get some good press releases out about that and keep your eyes peeled for new investments in equity funds. Uh, next question, Andrew. Uh, the next question is pertaining to one of our attendees had heard that Madam Vice President had announced a $12 billion project uh, for the region to provide support to private investment led by women and was wondering if this was related to our 2X initiative and the commitments that we listed. Al Jean, I believe they're talking about your statement. Do you want to just reiterate that? Yes, it absolutely is related to, to the 2X initiative. It was um, the initiative that, um, you know, develop the, we developed the new goals and metrics for, um, uh, for the 2X program. And we um, highlighted that and, and pointed out to the vice, vice president's office, uh, as, as I said, um, the um, representative um, for DFC to the White House's Gender Policy Council. And when the uh, vice president was coming to the region, we made sure that she knew about our, our commitment and we uh, made that announcement, had her make that announcement on behalf of DFC. So absolutely is, is all interconnected. Thank you for, for, for that comment, question. Thank you. Andrew, what's our next question? The next one is asking about uh, contact channels for private sector businesses. This one is specifically for El Salvador, but I think in general, just touching on the contact information that will be shared. Yeah, as I mentioned, Roxanne will go over all of the contact paths for you. You will see on there, in addition to uh, individuals at DFC and individuals at Nathan Associates, you will see the El Salvador Embassy contacts and you can always reach out to them as well. Next question. The next question is, um, sustainability and rural development programs are important but require startup ca capital. Mm -hmm. Are there resources that you provide that are reimbursable or non-reimbursable for different projects? I think what you mean is, are there grants? Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's what they're asking about. Mm -hmm. um, and there are grants often available through USAID programs, um, through other US government programs. Our grants are limited to those projects that we expect to either finance or provide political risk insurance for. And if we offer them, they're very targeted uh, grants, perhaps used for a marketing purpose, a technical purpose, or a feasibility study related to the project. I see Megan Buckley is on. Megan, would you like to talk about our technical assistance program? Sure, thank you, Meryl. Yes, yeah, so I'm um, Megan Buckley. I'm a director on the technical assistance program at DFC. We provide grant funding to support projects in the pre-investment stage as well as post-investment. For pre-investment, we can support up to 50% of the cost of a feasibility study or any other project development work that would be needed for the project to reach financial close from DFC. And if that is, if the project is successful in reaching financial close, that 50% grant funding would be repayable to DFC. We will also provide technical assistance for post-investment projects. Um, 
with uh, a grant covering up to 50% of the cost of the technical assistance designed to increase the developmental impact of the project or improve the commercial sustainability. And if um, we provide this post-investment support, it's a pure grant and it would not be required to be repaid to DFC. Thanks so much, Megan. Andrew, next question. Uh, we have two questions that are asking about um, small businesses. Uh, and one of them is asking, what is our definition of small businesses in Latin America? Um, and both questions are kind of asking about the minimum DFC transaction sizes and uh, transactions or financing needs that are below a million dollars. I'd like to turn this over to Rashonda Johnson, if I could. She's in our Office of Development Credit. They tend to provide the loans for our smaller projects. She can address how we support um, smaller loans. Uh, before I turn that over to her though, I do wanna say that generally loans have to be at least a million dollars in order to be um, effective as a tool for, for development impact for DFC. Rashonda, are you available? Give you a sure, second. Thank you, thank you, you Rashonda. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for, for that. Um, so in terms of uh, the how we characterize small um, businesses, I believe that we go by the same definition as the SBA. Um, and Meryl, maybe you can help me out on that area. But in terms of our finance program, as you mentioned, the minimum amount that we typically lend is $1 million with a maximum being uh, $1 billion at DFC. Thank you. I believe that we do use um, what is, I guess, IFC's World Bank's definitions of small business. Roxanne, do you want to comment on that? I know you've done a lot of work on this. Yes, um, it's been a while since I've thought about this, but I think the the, the number is um, uh, an organization with less than 500 individuals. And I want to say maybe the number is between five and 15 that reflects a small business. Yeah, I guess the important thing to note is the so you must be able to handle, your company must be able to handle a million dollar loan to receive direct support from DFC. But I want to emphasize that we often do provide guarantees to banks that then are offering loans for micro enterprises and small enterprises, much smaller than that. And we invest in funds that can invest in projects that are smaller than that. So while we may not directly give out something much smaller for a micro enterprise, we are very often active in providing guarantees for banks that then offer MSME support. Andrew, next question. Uh, we had a question from somebody that has a company that exports coffee and fruits, and they were wondering if their business qualifies for financial support. And I think that they're asking um, on what sectors we support and do not mm -hmm. support. There are prohibited sectors, and those include gambling, military equipment and weapons, um, alcohol only is only prohibited in countries where it is actually illegal to have alcohol, for example, some of the Middle East. Otherwise, we can support that. Um, so generally, most sectors are okay in on a you know an initial glance. I will say that if a product is going to compete directly uh, in a significant way with US production, US jobs, if there's going to be a, a significant loss of US jobs, as the result of us supporting a project, we do have to uh, walk away from that one. Um, but in most cases, we certainly have done coffee and fruit projects in the past. So I would encourage you to reach out to us and let us see the project details. Andrew? Um, yeah, I, had, I wanted to yes. add just one thing that DFC just recently um, uh, pledged $1 billion towards uh, food security uh, financing. Sure. Um, and so it, the food sector and food security is really critical. So I wanted to just make that point as well. Thank you, Algene. That's an excellent point. Should have thought of that myself. <laughs> Andrew, what have you got? 
Uh, the next question is what happens when a project is approved and starts well, but for some reason is not successful and kind of uh, what are the typical things that happen in a process where projects end up not being successful? So first of all, of course, we try to evaluate a project up front for commercial viability. And when we do the credit analysis, it is not just for our advantage, it's also for the local investor's advantage. We don't want you to put your family savings or the money your business has saved for years into a project that is not likely to succeed. That doesn't benefit anyone and it doesn't create any development impact. But sometimes projects that look very good up front run into issues, uh, for example, COVID, you know, that they could never have expected, or local conditions change, for example, with political changes. Um, or sometimes the market just did not evolve the way that the investor expected it to. DFC considers itself patient capital. That means that our first reaction when you are running into issues is not to shut you down and take any collateral we've got lined up, but rather to work with you to try to solve your problems, to try to help you through the rough spots. I know of many projects that I have seen or worked on where we were able to turn things around and a project was able to succeed ultimately. Um, so, you know, do be aware that we will evaluate your project quite clearly from a credit perspective up front. But we also understand the challenges of working in emerging markets. And we will try our best to try to help you through any rough spots you run into. Andrew? Can companies who are already working with USAID projects apply to funding from DFC? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is probably a nice opportunity if Felicia is still on for me to turn to Felicia and let her talk a little bit about our MTU program. Perfect, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you everyone for a fantastic presentation. Uh, for everyone, I'm Felicia Bacall, I'm the Managing Director for the Latin American, Europe and Eurasia team with a Mission Transaction Unit. We are the team that works directly with USAID. So if you're working specifically with any USAID mission or USAID operating unit, please contact them and me and we can work together to access all of the tools of the DFC. Thank you so much, Felicia. Uh, Andrew, do we have more questions? Uh, yes, and I think this one is asking, um, this one is asking about any form of advisory that uh, our participants will have in terms of submitting their application, mm. um, what that process will look like once they get in contact with us. That's an excellent question, particularly for this event today, because we don't always have advisory services available. Um, I see Roxanne wants to comment on this. So Roxanne, you're on mute. Hi, yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah, so one of the things that you, we haven't had, but we do have in this case is um, the team that's led by Algene Shajiri has been able to work with a consultant who will be available to help support you as you put your application um, Act your ap applications together. What's great about that is that that will give you, you know, probably a better chance of being assured that you have um, the materials that you need to demonstrate that you're hitting the eligibility requirements. Um, we recognize that it can be quite a bit of paperwork, and we're coming up with tools and toolkits and all kinds of great materials that will enable you to be better prepared this time around as you try and work with us, um, you know, this year. Thanks. And, and in a minute, Roxanne will give you the contact information for Athena Group, which is the group she's referring to. Andrew, do we have more questions? Uh, what is the criteria or threshold to classify a company as Greenfield or Brownfield? Um, really, Greenfield is a new investment that hasn't been opened and run operated before. Brownfield is an investment that's already operating that may need to expand or to renovate or to innovate in some way. Next question. We have a question that's asking about um, at what interest rates are the loans provided and mm -hmm. touching more on interest rates. Uh, is Rashonda, Rashan, do you wanna address this? I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Meryl. So our uh, rates are based on the US Treasury rate of a similar tenure at the time of disbursement. And then DFC will add a risk spread onto that base rate. And that's typically an additional one to 4% on top of the base rate. Thank you, Rashonda. 
Andrew? Um, in order to access credit or equity, is there a minimum number of jobs that we must generate? Uh, no, there's no minimum, but we are going to look at your project to see what are your development impacts. Your development impact may not even be in creation of jobs, but you may have a development impact uh, in another area. For example, you're introducing a new technology to the market that they've never had access to before, or your, your project is going to lead to the development of many entrepreneurial opportunities or to educate a large number of people or to create housing. Um, so number of jobs is a great thing for us to see in a project, but it is not the only evidence of development impact. Andrew? Um, we have two questions and staying on job creation. Somebody uh, asked that um, if they can apply for working capital loan, considering that they work in the res restaurant industry and that they are strong job creators. And then the second one is in terms of preference of the geographic area of production, um, is that something that we take into account? I'm going to let Rashonda address the working capital issue. If I could turn it back to you, Rashonda. Sure. So usually we don't just provide our programs aren't uh, catered towards projects that are just seeking working capital. Um, we would look at you to be seeking financing for other costs as well. But um, maybe this is something that we could connect offline about if, if um, you still have further questions about that. Yeah, generally, to just reiterate what Rashonda said, we would more likely uh, be looking at, you know, how can we help you expand the business or renovate or put some other direct investment into the project, then working capital may be a piece of the project. Uh, and your question about locations, obviously, we have a set of emerging markets where we operate, we prioritize lower income and lower middle income countries. Um, there is a list of DFC eligible countries at dfc.gov. Andrew? I think, I think that question was more asking within a country and they were specifically ah. referencing Guatemala, if there's any preference on geographic mm -hmm. area within a country that, that we take into account. Obviously projects that happen in areas where there's limited infrastructure, where we're adding infrastructure, for example, water in areas where there is no water or power energy where there is none. Those are great projects and developmental impacts, but we're not limited from working in Guatemala City, for example, not prohibited from doing so. Andrew? Um, and then we had one more question that was going back uh, to any type of loans that is not as high as a million dollars, if there's anything below that. Um... Yeah, the, anything below that is more likely to be a loan that is provided by an, a financial institution that we are supporting. So we might support a bank such as DPR Industria, which is then lending themselves to much smaller entities. But we ourselves, if we're making the loan, it should be a million dollars or more in most cases. Do we have and any more? We, we have one more that just came in. Um, so they were asking um, how the aggregate rates in terms of interest rates uh, compare to the rates available in the countries and, and kind of how our rates compare with in-country rates. Roxanne, do you wanna address that? Sure, happy to. So, you know, I, I love that you've asked this question. I've actually done some research with Stanford University around it. And in fact, our rates tend to be about three to four percent lower than many of the regions that we work in. It's part of the reason why many people are interested in working with us, because not only are our rates lower, but we often offer a bit of a moratorium, particularly in areas like project finance. Um, and then the other piece is that our tenors tend to be much longer than the average um, local bank. So whereas, um, you know, maybe the local bank might have a tenor of, you know, three to five years or two years, plus a, 
you know, they want you to pay back the loan immediately and don't have much of a moratorium on when you can start paying back. You know, we tend to be actually, you know, fairly um, competitive in that regard. And that's often what makes, um, that's often what's helpful to our value proposition. And then that's what our additionality is. And then other banks seeing the success of our, as Merrill calls it, um, patient capital approach, they often then follow suit and kind of change their rules in order to be able to better meet the needs of their local market. And that's a good point for me to turn the rest of the program over to Roxanne. If we did not get to your question today, feel free to send them to um, Andrew Yavinsky at andrew.yavinsky at dfc.gov, and we will make sure that we respond to them in writing. Uh, Roxanne, I'm going to turn it over to you for the introduction of key officials and closing remarks. I will thank you so much, Meryl, and thanks to everyone for all of your hard work and all of the um, uh, the experts who came in and spoke and shared a little bit about what they do. So I want to give you all a chance to kind of learn who's your kind of key point of contact. First of all, um, there's Andrew Uvinsky, who is our develop one of the members of the CEO team, the Chief Development Officers team, and then there's Kat Levin. She's the associate who's done quite a bit of the uh, the background planning and the logistics and operational planning. She's with Nathan Associates. They're going to be kind of your key point of contact between now and I would say January 21st. But I want to introduce you to folks on the ground who you may want to build a relationship with as you think not only about what the DFC can provide, but what our other partners in the USG, the US government, um, can provide in terms of resources as you think about you know, growing and expanding your business. So I will introduce people and they'll say a quick hi and then we're going to move forward because we're kind of respectful of your time. So first of all, there is, let me get that. So the first person I want to introduce you to is John Sepula. He's the trade and investment officer for Guatemala City. John, are you available? Yes, uh, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, nice to be here and uh, we're at your service. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then there is Whitney Dubinsky, also based in Guatemala. She is the DFC liaison, liaison for US Agency for International Development. Okay. She may not be on, but you're going to receive with this present, you're, um, along with um, our follow up details, we're going to send you a couple things that I think are going to be useful. The first is you will receive a copy of the presentation that will provide you with the names, the titles, and the emails of individuals that you can contact. The second thing that you're going to receive is a document from, um, the, from Nathan Associates and from Katya that kind of lays out just some details around questions that you should be asking relate yourself related to your, the eligibility requirements. That's going to be really helpful. So as you follow up with um, the, or, the DFC organization, that will make sure that you have all the tools, at least the basic tools and information needed to be able to move forward with a productive conversation. Um, in terms of Honduras, I'm going to introduce you to a couple people. The first is Scott Hansen. He's the economic counselor. Scott, are you here? Hi. Yeah, hey, this is actually Dan Rittenhouse. Scott couldn't make it today, but okay. uh, I'm the I'm the act I'm the deputy economic uh, counselor here, and we look forward to working with you all. Thank you very much for this. Great. And then there's Hector Maldonado. I don't know if you're here as well. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, buenos dias, Hector Maldonado, aquí en la Embajada de los Estados Unidos a la orden. And then finally, I want to introduce you to Andrew McCallan. Andrew McCallan is the um, DFC liaison who works with us in partnership with USAID. So on transactions where USAID can be a partner, um, Andrew would be a person to contact. Andrew, is, are you available? Yeah. I'm here. Sure. Hi. Oh. Good morning, everybody. Great. Buenos dias. Solo Great. Para mostrar la cara. All right. Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, then there is for El Salvador, um, we have Aaron Fate. Aaron Fate is the Deputy Economic Counselor in El Salvador. Hello, everyone. Uh, my camera's working. 
nice yeah. to meet you all. Um, I look forward uh, to uh, working with you. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out. I don't know if my colleagues are here. We have quite a few people traveling. Um, but of course, if you send us uh, emails, we'll get back to you. Thanks. And then, of course, there's Melissa McInnes. I don't know if she's here. Okay. And then Michelle Back, who is the um, DFC liaison for, San for El Salvador. So what you have here in this contacts page is a list of a variety of people that you can contact. I just want to highlight that there's Katya Levin, who is the associate, like I said, who's responsible for the operations and planning. There are specific individuals related to the country that you can contact if there are um, if there's you know, questions that you have. And, and particularly, I think, reach out to um, your country representative if you're saying, you know what, I'm not sure that I'm appropriate for DFC right now, but are there other tools available through the US government that I can also use? They will be great resources to kind of direct you. But if you know that you, know, you have a specific transaction and you think, you know what, actually, I think I'm ready to move forward, I'd reach out to Kati 11, uh, certainly until January. January 21st. The next thing that I would say is on the next page, on you'll see the name of uh, two people after January 21st. If there's someone that you want to reach out to, um, I would reach out to some of you have mentioned the importance of having maybe some technical assistance as you think about putting your materials together. You can reach out to Kyleen uh, Alvarez or Alvaro Espitia. So both of these individuals are available. So there's a lot of information here. What I would say is the first thing, your first point of contact is um, Catch 11 from um, Nathan Associates. She will be sending out, she and her team will be sending out a couple things that will be good resources for you. First, they'll be sending out the presentation. Second, they'll be sending out some materials that lay out our eligibility requirements. And third, they'll be sending out a template. And that will give you the ability to, to take that template, fill it in with all of the kind of key information information that you think you need, um, that you think will be you know, key information about your particular transaction, transaction. And then I'd reach out to her and then they will start the process of pre-screening you. As we go forward, once we get into middle of January, then that will transition to Alvaro Spita and Kalina Alvarez. Those will be the individuals who will be helping you with technical assistance that you will need. Now, if you say, you know what, I don't think I'm ready for DFC just yet. We've provided you with a list of specific points of contact that you can reach out to, and they can talk to you about other products and serv services that are available with um, the US government that you can avail yourself of. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, we also wanna thank, take this time to thank you. You have many things that you can do with your time. We thank you that you've taken the time to be with us, learn more about what we do. Um, as um, Al Jean and Merrill and others on the team have articulated, we care very deeply about supporting women and women entrepreneurs and executives. And we, we hope that you see that and we hope that this creates opportunities and gets you excited about working with us because we're excited about the opportunity to work with you. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon.